Hello. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to Roy Vet third quarter 2023 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask the question during this session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone, and you will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. I would now like to hand the conference over to Stephanie Lee. You may begin. Good morning, and thanks for joining today's call to review Worthen's financial results for the third quarter ended December 31, 2023, along with a business update. I'm Stephanie Lee with Royven. Presenting today, we have Matt Klein, CEO of Royven. For those dialing in via conference call, you can find the slides being presented today, as well as the press release announcing these updates on our IR website at www.investor.royvance.com. We'll also be providing the current slide numbers as we present to help you follow along. I'd like to remind you that we'll be making certain forward-looking statements during today's presentation. We strongly encourage you to review the information that we have filed with the SEC for more information regarding these forward-looking statements and related risks and uncertainties. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thank you, Steph, and thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, I appreciate uh, I appreciate it. Uh, it's nice to be able to talk about our, our third quarter results here. Um, on slide four, just a, a brief overview of the agenda. So we'll talk a, a little bit about a recap of last calendar year, uh, and then we'll spend some time on the recent data coming out of Munivant during the quarter, uh, some time uh, talking about the upcoming proof of concept readout at Prepositinib in NIU. Uh, we'll do a review of performance of Vitama, uh, highlight some upcoming catalysts and a financial update, and then turn it over to Q&A. It should be a relatively short presentation today. So. Uh, we've talked a fair amount about last year, and this will be the last time that we take a victory lap forward. But on slide five, I just want to remind everybody of uh, the year we're coming off of, uh, during which uh, we continue to both commercialize and maybe even more importantly develop Vitama with positive phase three data in both of our of both of our studies, uh, setting us up for an atopic dermatitis approval that we hope will come later this year, following an NDA filing that we hope will go in an SNDA filing we hope will go in uh, very shortly. Uh, we have um, the sort of full round trip of our anti one a antibody, which you're all quite familiar with at this point, culminating in the sale to Roche that closed during this quarter. Uh, we uh, generated both at this point uh, pr proof of concept data, or not, I should say, uh, initial human data uh, from IMVT-1402 uh, showing that our next generation anti serum antibody suppresses IgG uh, we believe as deep as any other and without uh, any impact on albumin or LDL and in a convenient sub-Q format. And also, we've shown data from our phase two study in Graves' disease that meaningfully exceeded our uh, expectations. We'll talk more about that on this call. Uh, and finally, uh, we read out Brepacitinib, our Tech 2 jack one data in SLE this quarter as well. Uh, unfortunately, it did not uh, meet our bar uh, or the primary endpoint, and so we've discontinued development in that indication and are looking forward to multiple additional readouts and, and, and programs from, from Brepacitinib to come. Um, I talked about this a little bit uh, in my JP Morgan presentation earlier this year, but on slide six, you know, one thing I think we're really proud of looking back is, you know, our model is built to develop data uh, for important clinical programs that matters to patients in as efficient a manner as possible. And I think if you look at our, uh, if you look at our, our, our track record here, this is a list of the largest global pharma companies, including the number of late stage readouts they had uh, last year, uh, and the R&D expense uh, sort of over the period, although obviously that's not a perfect comparison. And uh, we are very proud of the extent to which we stand out for being included on this list at all, given the amount of data we generated, uh, and at a, a obviously significantly lower, generally order of magnitude lower cost which just gets to the, the model of capital efficiency with which we, uh, which we bring programs in and which we develop them. And we're excited to continue to do that in our strong capital position. Uh, 2024 for us on slide seven is really about, about growth and expansion. Uh, it's about maybe first and foremost uh, delivering clinical data and strategic updates for our NTFCRN franchise. Uh, we are already making progress in laying out an aggressive, expansive development program for that franchise, and Munivant provided some updates yesterday. Uh, in short, we're looking at 10 indications over the next couple of years with four to five potentially registrational programs starting uh, in the next fiscal year, so, so something that we think will 
uh, help us to fully realize the value of that, uh, we, we think, potentially best-in-class anti-FGRN antibody. Uh, we uh, expect to advance clinical development for a range of underappreciated pipeline opportunities, including in brepacitinib, in the milimab, uh, and uh, in a program that's underappreciated because we haven't talked about it at all, a program that we licensed uh, in, the, in the second half of 2023. Uh, we expect to uh, shortly ahead file our SNDA for VTAM and atopic dermatitis. Uh, we hope to continue to accelerate revenue growth in psoriasis, uh, and uh, we are really looking forward to the launch in atopic dermatitis, I think has the potential to uh, continue to change the trajectory of the program. Uh, we know there's a lot of focus on this next point. Uh, this is one of the or probably the best environment we have ever seen for business development. And we are actively looking at some pipeline expansion opportunities that I'll just call uh, tr transformative in, in the sort of mid to late stage development stage areas. Uh, we uh, don't have an update on specific programs to share today. I can't say exactly when we will, but I am enormously excited at some of the things that we have our, our, our eyes and potentially hands on. And then uh, we expect in the relatively near term here to finalize our capital allocation strategy across our various opportunities and to be able to provide uh, significant updates. To, to that end on slide eight, you know, when we did the deal with Roche, uh, we asked uh, all of you to, to be a little patient with us uh, as we sorted through our best options for allocating uh, what is now a $6.7 billion consolidated cash balance. And we expect to use it for three things as a reminder, uh, ensuring that Roivind is capitalized to profitability, uh, expanding our pipeline, as I mentioned on the previous slide, and then, uh, to, to return capital to shareholders in an amount and form that makes maximal sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, in short, uh, we think that the time for patience here is coming to an end. Uh, we think we'll be able to provide meaningful updates on this in the near future, and I expect this will be the last earnings call uh, on which we're calling for, uh, on which we're calling for, 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 for patients uh, as we work things through. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to continuing to crystallize that plan. Um, on slide nine, as a reminder, we are uh, very excited about our late stage program. Uh, it includes uh, a number of a number of, of drugs and potential drugs that we will talk about today, including the Tama, including the FCRN franchise with Batoclumab and IMVT1402, including Brepacitinib and the Milimab. Uh, it also includes that uh, undisclosed phase two program uh, that, that I've mentioned a few times here that we will definitely be providing more detail on uh, a little bit later this year. I, I want to highlight up front, uh, we had told the world that we were going to develop uh, or, or generate some data uh, in uh, RVT 2001, our SF3V1 modulator in, uh, in transfusion-dependent anemia uh, for low-risk MDS patients. Uh, I want to report that, unfortunately, the, the data generated in that Phase 1-2 study did not meet our bar for progressing, and so uh, we've decided to discontinue development of RVT 2001 after an interim analysis of that data. Uh, happy to share some more color on it. Uh, we spent a uh, reasonable, modest low double-digit million-dollar sum uh, on the program, and, uh, you know, I think just sometimes these things don't work out the way you want scientifically, and so uh, we're trying to be efficient in making those decisions. Um, so I want to turn now to Immunivant. Uh, you know, I mentioned before we are very focused on uh, an exciting, broad uh, development strategy there that sets up the program for maximum value across the range of strategic options. As a reminder, uh, we are very excited about the next generation uh, antibody there, INVT1402, uh, which we think offers uh, deep IgG lowering, uh, similar to Batoclumab, we think as deep as any uh, anti-FCRN antibody that, that we are aware of, uh, with a clean analyte profile uh, with no or minimal effect on albumin or LDL, uh, formulated uh, for a simple subcutaneous injection designed to hopefully enable self-administration uh, with an auto-injector, uh, and uh, with patent life that goes out on a composition of matter basis, not excluding PTEs until 2043. So uh, a, a tremendously exciting drug. Uh, that's against a backdrop on slide 12 of continued and growing evidence that deeper IgG suppression in general yields better clinical benefit across a variety of indications. As a reminder, that includes the data at the patient level in myasthenia gravis showing that in individual patients, those with greater IgG declines had better MGADL improvements. Uh, that includes data from both our TED study, which uh, we've made fully available, and our GRAVE study, which we have not. In, in both of those studies, uh, we were able to see uh, significantly better efficacy at our higher dose, uh, 680 milligrams of atoclumab equivalent to 600 milligrams of IMVT1402. 
Uh, in the ITP data generated by UCB, we saw greater IgG reduction yielding greater platelet responses. And in Janssen's uh, RA data put out earlier this year, J&J's RA data, they showed that greater IgG reduction correlated with greater autoantibody reduction, which in turn correlated with greater clinical responses. So we feel uh, very privileged that our drug has the, the clinical profile that it appears to. Uh, as a reminder on slide 13, and, and although it feels like a long time ago, this data was indeed generated in the uh, in the third fiscal quarter for us at 600 milligrams, uh, we show uh, we show our data showing again uh, that clean uh, clean deep IgG suppression coming from both the 300 milligram and 600 milligram subcutaneous dosing over uh, over four doses with uh, with effectively no impact, as you can see on the right hand two charts on albumin or LDL. Um, and uh, we, we believe, based on this data, that we will suppress IgG to 80 plus percent uh, with sort of full length dosing. That came together on slide 14 as a reminder with a, a clean safety profile with uh, a limited and not particularly dose dependent uh, adverse events and nothing that stands out as particularly problematic. So a clean profile, no severe TEAs uh, reported across uh, any arm to date. So we're, uh, we're, we're pleased with that. Um, and then I want to just spend a minute on Graves' disease. Uh, we've said we're not talking a lot about this data because, as we've pointed out, anybody's phase two data is everybody's phase two data uh, in FCRN. Uh, but, but we are uh, excited about the Graves' opportunity. You can see on slide 15 the design of that trial involves 12 weeks of dosing at 680 milligrams, the high dose, and then 12 weeks of doting at dosing at 340 milligrams, the lower dose. Uh, and these are all patients with active Graves' disease, as a reminder, who are on stable ATD prior to the stable dose of antithyroid drugs prior to the screening visit and who had uncontrolled thyroid hormone levels, were hyperthyroid despite being on ATDs. And the primary endpoint was uh, patients who achieved normalization of thyroid hormones at week 12 and 24. The primary was 24. Uh, with uh, ideally with lower ATD dose versus their baseline ATD dose. Uh, and uh, you can remember the bar that we set for that was that we wanted 50% of patients to respond. Uh, and what we've said publicly about the study on slide 16 is that we meaningfully exceeded uh, that uh, response rate uh, and that we had numerically higher responses for dose tapering and, and ATD discontinuation in patients on the higher doses compared with the lower dose which we think sets us up really well to be uh, not only, we believe, sort of first in class in, in Graves' disease, but, but potentially best in class in Graves' disease, given our unique profile. Uh, we continue to demonstrate uh, significant deep IgG suppressions up to approaching 90% with a mean of 81%, uh, and that was meaningfully greater at 680 than it was at the 340 milligram dose as expected. Uh, and uh, we've said, we intend to pivot development here from uh, Betoclamab, where we were really running this study as a proof of concept, to IMVT1402, uh, with plans that we will announce this year, along with the overall development strategy for 1402. So uh, more to come on that opportunity uh, as we continue to build out uh, our analysis and, frankly, as we continue to set ourselves up to, to be first. Um, as a reminder on slide 17, uh, there are now 22 indications announced during development across the NTFCRN class. You know, we get some questions about competitive intensity in, in various specific places from other mechanisms. And a thing that is remarkable to me is the breadth of these indications is such that relative to almost any other class, the competitive intensity for FCRN is surprisingly low, uh, where, you know, in any individual indication, there might be a couple of mechanisms, but, but basically no other mechanism currently cuts across the full set here. And we see tremendous opportunity for a broad development strategy maximizing that unique set of competitive positioning uh, across disease states. So, as I said, more to come on 1402 this year. We expect some, some continued big unveils on uh, both the, the potentially on the strategic side and definitely on the development side. So uh, stay tuned uh, and looking forward to continuing to provide those updates over the course of the coming months. Um, Lastly, on the late-stage clinical pipeline, I just want to remind everybody on oral brepacitinib that we are uh, really uh, pushing forward our development strategy in orphan rheumatology. Uh, we are focused today on uh, our uh, what we hope will be a, a single registrational study in dermatomyositis that we'll read out next year, uh, and, and that is enrolling nicely, as well as, uh, you know, proof of concept data coming, I'll talk more about this in a second, in non-infectious uveitis 
and would continue to evaluate other possible indications, including uh, HS, which has obviously gotten a lot of intention, attention as an indication this year. And as a reminder, this drug also has quite long IP protection going out to at least 2039, inclusive of patent term extensions. Um, I want to just remind everybody on the eve of the proof of concept data that we expect to generate qu quite soon here uh, on non-infectious uveitis on slide 20. You know, this is one of these uh, orphan inflammatory diseases uh, that is, is debilitating. There are 30,000 new cases of legal blindness attributed to NIU uh, each year, uh, with 75,000 or more patients living with non-anterior NIU uh, in the U.S. Uh, most common symptoms are sensitivity, pain, redness, and floaters in the vision. Uh, and uh, there's really there's only one approved therapy. It's only Humira, uh, and we see a uh, an important unmet need given the number of patients who are progressing. Our trial design on slide 21, uh, it's not placebo-controlled, but it is a blinded two-dose study uh, between 45 and 15 milligrams, uh, randomized in favor of the 45 milligram dose. Uh, and uh, what we expect based on uh, evidence that we have, and we have evidence from, including from a study of Fulgatinib that demonstrated the relevance of JAK1 inhibition, and then IL-12 and 23, which are specifically mediated by TIC2, are also clearly involved in the pathobiology. So, uh, we're optimistic about the mechanism here, and the success criteria we've set is basically a sort of, uh, if you think about it as a virtual placebo, a 45 milligram arm treatment failure rate of no greater than 70%, uh, which is sort of what we think the sort of placebo bar would be in an ongoing study. Obviously, given the small number of patients, we'll be looking at this data on an individual patient level, uh, and I expect we'll be sharing it, uh, as we've said, in the first calendar quarter of 2024. Uh, the enrollment of this data is uh, is complete, so we're looking forward to to, to, to getting that data uh, in the near future. Um, so I want to turn uh, qu quickly over to uh, another, at this point, underappreciated part of our story, which is Vitama. Uh, we continue to see uh, reasonable script growth in psoriasis. You can see it on slide 23. We remain the best-selling branded topical in psoriasis, as we have been since the very beginning of our launch. Uh, and uh, we, we are excited to continue to, to see that growth uh, develop. Um, We've now had over 300,000 prescriptions written by over 14,000 doctors. Our revenue continues to grow reasonably nicely. We're up to 20.7 million in net product revenue for the quarter. Our gross net yield has been accreting slowly, and we expect, roughly speaking, that trend will continue over the next year. And we're now at very good payer coverage with 137 million commercial lives covered over 83%, sort of the coverage that we were hoping for. Turning to, to the, the next big opportunity here in atopic dermatitis on slide 25, uh, as you may have seen, we read out recently uh, data from our uh, long-term extension study, the Adoring 3 study, uh, which is a 48-week study in atopic dermatitis, uh, and we showed pr pretty remarkable data, over a 50% uh, IgA uh, score of clear, uh, an 80% EZ75 improvement. Um, and just, just some great data overall here that puts us, frankly, uh, not only uh, at the head of the pack in our view from a topical perspective, but, but uh, in line, frankly, with the efficacy of, of some systemic therapies in these populations. So uh, a, a really tremendous set of data here uh, that, uh, that, that continues to support what we think is a really big opportunity in AD and notably uh, continue to have a clean safety profile with uh, mild to moderate AEs, uh, nothing sort of remarkable, and a very low discontinuation rate due to adverse events. Um, you know, we expect to, as I said, file the SNDA in atopic dermatitis uh, shortly, uh, and that'll set us up for a potential approval later this year. Uh, it uh, needs to be said again, atopic dermatitis is a large and growing market with uh, close to 350,000 topical prescriptions written every week, the vast majority of them corticosteroids. And with a real opportunity, we think, for Vitama to, to shape that field as a drug with as an efficacy uh, at the head of the pack from a uh, from an atopic dermatitis or overall perspective and uh, with a safety and tolerability profile that we think further differentiates fr from some of our competitors. So uh, a really exciting opportunity, and notably our next fiscal year, we will have a quarter of sales uh, and hopefully some data on script volume in atopic dermatitis. So really looking forward to getting out there in that sort of full breadth of the patient population. Um, rounding out the year on slide 28, you know, uh, we've talked about some of the opportunities here, but we have a, a, a lot of interesting clinical data coming. Uh, obviously, NIU we've talked about, 
Uh, we've talked about uh, some of the upcoming FCRN data, but notably this year we're going to develop uh, Phase 2B data in CIDP in Batokumab that should help to start establishing deep IgG suppression potentially as mattering in more diseases. Same thing with our uh, Phase 3 program in Myasthenia Gravis, where we expect to begin getting data uh, at, at the end of this year, again, uh, setting us up for uh, some, some real potential, in, including uh, the first simple sub-2 to read out phase 3 data in that indication. And then we're also going to get data this year from nemilimab, our anti-GMCSF antibody, and sarcoidosis, uh, a program that we think gets no value attributed to it today, but which we think has the potential to be very important in the event of successful data. You, you know, on the financials, on slide 30, um, you know, net revenues for the quarter of 37.1, including uh, VCOM product revenue of 20.7, uh, R&D expense of 120, about $1 million dollars, adjusted non-GAAP of, of about 115, uh, SGNA of about 200 million, or adjusted of about 150, uh, and uh, something I don't know that I'll be able to report uh, in the near future again. Uh, net income of 5.1 billion, uh, which uh, is uh, is a number obviously related to the closing of the uh, of the Roche deal leaving us with cash and cash equivalents uh, of $6.7 billion as of the end of the year, uh, a position we're very excited about. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll close just by asking you to flash up slide 32 and, and note that we have quite a rich, uh, quite a rich set of catalysts coming and, and more to come as we continue to build out uh, and talk more about uh, parts of our pipeline that we're, uh, we're excited about but haven't unveiled publicly yet. So uh, with that, I will wrap up the presentation here. Uh, and I uh, would thank you to everybody for listening. I will turn it over to the operator for Q&A. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder to ask the question, please press star 11 on your telephone and then wait to hear your name announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Allison Braxill with Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, and thanks for taking the question. Um, so, Matt, I think I heard your characterization of the current setup as, uh, as very conducive to BD um, and, your, and how you see, you know, pipeline expansion opportunities that are transformative. I guess, could you maybe set some guardrails on your current thinking on BD? You know, transformative makes it sound like you're looking at a single versus multiple opportunities, but not from, a, you know, interpreting that, that correctly. And then I, I think also you, I heard you say we should have an update on the capital allocation strategy before the next earnings report. Could you just help us understand kind of what's gating to that disclosure and, and how you expect to communicate that um, to the street? Thanks. Yeah, yes. So on the first question, I'm, I'm glad you asked it, and I'll ask my youth to chime in as well because I think it's important. Uh, when I the, the general sort of scope of things we're looking at, I'd say – match the kinds of deals that we've done before. So partnerships or acquisitions of late stage programs generally, uh, more likely I would say to be programs than M&A. Uh, I'd say um, potentially multiple uh, o over the next year, including, uh, including some of the ones we've already done. Uh, and, you know, when I say transformative, what I mean by that is, you know, I think these will be programs, at least some of them, going into – uh, large late stage studies of a kind that will change the shape of our pipeline uh, and add meaningful heft to what we think is already a, a pretty great late stage effort. Mike, anything you'd, you'd add to that? Sorry, Mike, you might be on mute. Um, okay. Um, if. Uh, if not, I'll go to the other question. But, but so, so thanks for asking my question. It's a, it's a, it's a good question, uh, and it's important that we be clear on what we're, what we're looking at there because I think it's less likely to be – either, frankly, it's less likely to be sort of M&A per se, never say never, but less likely and potentially not going to be a single program, maybe multiple. And then on the capital allocation point, so, you know, look, I think uh, certainly by the time of our next earnings call, I expect to have made some meaningful progress here. You know, I, I – so I say this is not just about uh, analysis, and this is a combination of, frankly, advancing some of these late-stage business development conversations so that we have a sense of the uh, exact breadth of the sort of BD piece of this, although I think it's, it's uh, hard to imagine that that combination of things is going to sort of meaningfully change the total picture. Uh, and then also, look, I think part of what we've talked about from a capital return perspective 
is the concentration of our shareholder base. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Sumitomo, for example, has indicated uh, a, a desire to uh, exit their position given their own financial considerations. You know, we, as you can imagine, uh, have ongoing discussions with all of our shareholders, uh, and I think we're, we're trying to to progress those in the optimal way for, for, for setting us up for success. So I think all of that is what is ongoing, uh, and once that resolves, we should be able to provide uh, more clarity. Okay, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from Milan of David Rissinger with Lyric Partners. Your line is open. Yes, thanks very much, and uh, thank you for all the updates, Matt. Uh, so could you please discuss both the Moderna LNP litigation event path ahead and also Pfizer LNP litigation developments to watch? I know that you're limited with respect to what you can say, but, um, you know, whatever you can provide on the call would be helpful. And then, uh, Richard, could you discuss the spend in 2024 uh, specifically, you know, SG&A and R&D. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. Uh, appreciate the questions as always, and appreciate that you uh, put, put the caveat out there for me about my uh, limited ability to, to comment here. You know, I think on the Moderna litigation, uh, one thing I can say, because it's obviously public information, is so we had our Markman or claim construction hearing uh, last week, um, you know, I think overall, I'll say uh, we were pleased with our ability to make the arguments that we thought were important to us, uh, and uh, it's an important hearing. We think that the judge is going to do a good job of considering of considering everything everyone brought to the table. Uh, so uh, we'll know more about the outcome for that. I think the, the 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 judge has said previously, sort of 60-ish days. There's no set timeline for that response. So um, you know, I think we're we're looking for it in about that time frame. But uh, it's a complicated set of issues, and we want to make sure uh, everything gets properly evaluated. So that's the next sort of significant event uh, on the Moderna side. Um, on the Pfizer side, uh, that case is ongoing. There's no set date for a Markman hearing, but we would expect it to take place sometime later this year. Um, so, uh, so that, that's all that's all ongoing, and appreciate. Uh, we know that a number of people are, are following along there. Uh, on the cash uh, side, I'll turn it over to Richard, as you suggested, but, but I'll just say, you know, I think there's sort of puts and takes here. Obviously, TL1A is out of the spend. Uh, Vitama continues to ramp, which is, which is uh, mostly helpful from a, from a cash burn perspective, but, but some of it also depends on, on programs that we either have or will bring in. But, Richard, any, any comments that you want to make on, uh, on spend for the next year? Yeah, I, w I would anticipate that spend would be relatively flat over the next few quarters. Obviously, once um, AD – approval comes through on Vitama uh, towards the end of the year, we would ramp up the sales efforts there. So you'd see an uptick uh, as we approach that uh, towards the end of the year. And then also as uh, the 1402 R&D spend uh, ramps up with the additional trials that we talked about that will also start coming through, but uh, relatively flat over the next few quarters and then see a ramp up as more trials come through. Also, we will see some data on NIU, so we'll have to make a decision there to see if we uh, do additional spending, depending on how that data reads out, uh, and then a sarcoidosis at the end of the year as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Brian Chen with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my questions this morning. Matt, in the last earnings call, we didn't touch on the asset that you acquired. I mean, it was reflected as a 14 million item in the in process R&D line in the 10Q. Can you give us more color here on the stage of the asset and indication? Um, how much data was there behind this program? And when could we see the next data update here? Uh, I have a quick follow-up. Thank you. Uh, sure, yep. So uh, on the unnamed asset, um, so we've now provided a little bit more color. We've indicated that the, the program should be entering phase two, so that should give you a sense on stage. Um, you, you know, I, I won't say too much more. Uh, it's in a space where we feel like we have a reasonably decent handle on what's going on, but it is a, it's a development stage program. Uh, and the reason we're not talking very much about it right now 
uh, is it's broadly a competitive space, and we think we have an opportunity to be ahead. So, so we'll talk more about it uh, later this year as the clinical program gets up and running. Um, and uh, so I think th uh, that was that was your main question there, right? And I think you had another one. Yeah, and related to Immunovent's plan here, um, it's quite a robust development plan for the next uh, one to two fiscal year. Um, with the speed that you're shooting for, do you see the need for Immunovent to partner off, or do you think that they can lean on Roy Van for additional financial resources? Yeah, thanks, Brian. That's a uh, it's a very good question. Look, I think as we think about sort of the combination of Royvent and Immunovant, there is certainly no uh, no financial need uh, for a partner per se. Uh, and I think the plan that we've laid out here, uh, while it's aggressive and while it's broad, uh, we've chosen it in part because we believe we are capable of the clinical execution. So, you know, with a program of this breadth of opportunity, I think we are certainly able uh, between Royvin and Immunovant and, and with the full use of resources at either that are needed uh, to, to, to do something big and important here. And I think, you know, there's, there are a few things going on at Royvin that are more important than the successful development of 1402. So if Immunovant would benefit from Royvin resources, either people or financial, uh, you can bet that we'll be having those conversations. That said, uh, it's a, although, the, although I said the competitive intensity is comparatively low, uh, it's obviously a competitive space and we have some uh, well-funded and strong operationally competitors. Uh, we think we can keep pace with any of them on clinical development, but certainly, uh, as we've said before, we're going to be ruthlessly economic in maximizing the value of the program, including thinking about partnership and other strategic opportunities for Immunivant uh, to make sure we aren't missing a beat. Great. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for listening. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Yaron Weber with TD Cohen. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Good morning. This is Joy Fon for your own. Thanks for taking our questions. Now that the lupus study is read out, what's your latest thinking on which indications to prioritize for preposinib, and when might we hear more about that broader indication list? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for thanks for listening, and thanks for the good question. Um, and we're very excited about preposinib. I will potentially ask Mayuk to comment a little bit on this too. You know, I think, uh, and I guess this is the maybe the first earnings call we've had since the Brett and the Blupus data. You know, I don't think we read much of anything into the program at all from the lupus readout. Uh, we had always sort of indicated we thought it was going to be a high risk readout uh, because of lupus disease dynamics. And frankly, the, the drug effect in the, in the study was reasonable, or in fact, quite good. Uh, the problem was we saw, as we've indicated, the largest placebo response rate I think ever observed in an SLE study. And so, you know, I, I don't think that gets particularly to the opportunity for the drug. And then the safety profile remained consistent with what we've observed historically. So I think the short answer is we are full speed ahead on our original plan. That centers around dermatomyositis, where the study continues to enroll well. That includes potentially NIU, and obviously, as, as, as Richard said, and as I said earlier, uh, we'll have to make a decision on what to do in NIU after observing that proof of concept data coming in the near future. And then, uh, you know, other indications, we, we continue to evaluate a, a reasonable breadth of indications that sort of fit in that, we we'll call it orphan rheumatology bucket. But um, you know, I'd say one that we are, are sort of making a decision on in the relatively near future, potentially uh, depending on what we see in NIU, et cetera, is HS. Uh, where we have quite good phase two data. So, so you know, I think th things that fit nicely with that are still on the list for us, but we're first and foremost focused on uh, on DM uh, and then NIU. Thank you. Thank you for the great question. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Dennis Ding with Jeffrey. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, and thanks for taking our questions. Uh, two for me. So. Um, regarding BD, can you please clarify your previous comments? You said not a single program, but multiple uh, multiple programs. Will this all come from a single announcement, or is this more like a string of pearls type of BD path over the next year? And then question number two around Immunovant, um, has the company engaged with the FDA yet on, um, on a registrational path for Graves and the level of confidence that 1402 can go directly to phase three and skip a phase two. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dan. I'll take the second question first, and then I'll briefly comment on the first, and I'll, I'll see if Mayuk 
uh, this time around has comments uh, on, on the BD question as well. You know, on, uh, on Immunivant, I think the main answer to that question is uh, we're going to leave it to Immunivant to make uh, the exact announcements of the clinical plan for 1402, but I think we're uh, working through uh, with FDA and otherwise all the important regulatory questions, uh, and I think we are, uh, you, know, you know, Immunivant's guidance that they're able to go into four to five uh, potentially registrational programs this year is certainly uh, – <laughs> an informed view of what they're going to be able to accomplish. So I think we're we're feeling good there, but we'll provide specific updates on any given indication uh, as and when we've got them. You know, on the BD side, again, thanks for thanks for the question. It's, it's a great question. It's important clarification. You know, this is not like we're working on a single large package deal of multiple things. This is just we see quite a lot out there that we're excited about. Uh, so we've already got the one in-house, and we've got a couple of other things that were, uh, you know, on our racket, I'd say. So I think it's more of a – I think you called it a string of pearls. I think it's more of a we see multiple programs and, and, and we'll bring potentially several things in over the next year and, frankly, beyond, right? It's just sort of just how we've always run our business. But, uh, Mayuk, uh, yeah, if you're on you any comments on it. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Me all right? Yep, yep, yep. Loud and clear. Yeah, that's, that's right. I think you, you hit the, the main point right at the end there. I mean, look, this is sort of regular regular course for us. Uh, we're always looking for promising assets where we think we can make a difference. and um, we're as focused on that as we've ever been. We're not resting. We're working hard towards it. Uh, the exact timing and sort of contours of that, uh, you know, are still still sort of unknown. But um, uh, you know, expect that uh, expect to hear more from us. Got it. Thank you. That's very helpful. And if I can just squeeze one last question here around NIU, given sure. uh, the uh, basic data is coming up soon, maybe. Uh, if you can comment on what's the bar for success here, given it's a small study and there's no placebo. I know there's some numbers in your slides around expecting, you know, less than 30% treatment failure rate, and you're estimating 80 to 90% simulated placebo, but just wondering if you may actually need to see a lower failure rate since placebo, uh, you know, if you look at Humira and, and uh, Vogotin, you know, placebo can be highly variable. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Actually, I'll hand it over. Mike, do you have uh, sort of uh, uh, thoughts on that question? If not, I can take it. You might be on mute. Yeah, no, I'm on. Um, uh, there we go. No, I don't have too much uh, too, too much there. I mean, I think, look, I think you both um, uh, pointed out that there is some variability there, but I think the, you know, look, I think we're looking at this in the same way that, that we look at all of our trials. We, we want to see for ourselves, uh, a pretty sort of clear, um, clear signal of efficacy. I think even accounting for, you know, some potential variability in, in sort of notional placebo rate. And we'll be excited to move forward if it's, if it's clear. The only other thing I'd add is, remember, this is a, it's a 24 patient study. Um, it's randomized in favor of the 45 milligram arm. My experience, our experience looking at phase two data is you sort of expect it to be a, like you hit F9 on the computer and you get a green thumbs up or a red thumbs down. And usually what you get is, you know, like a greenish triangle or something like that. And you're like, what does that mean? And so I, I think you can imagine it's hard to reduce the extra data that we're going to get from the study into a single number. We did set that bar of a 70% treatment failure rate, but I just think you can you can be clear. We're going to be looking at every patient and, and trying to make sure we understand what the drug is doing. And these are these are quite sick patients. Again, 30,000 new cases of blindness uh, every year. So, you know, it's something where we feel like we have an opportunity to make a big difference with the right clinical picture. The, the, there are two other points to add there. I think, um, look, we are sort of hoping to see – you know, a bit of a dose response here and that, like, while there's not a placebo, there is a, you know, relatively low dose of Brepo that ought to give a little bit of a, let's just call it maybe not placebo, but something kind of closer to placebo on efficacy and the 15 milligram dose. Uh, that's thing one. And thing two is I think at least in contextualizing the Humira, um, you know, sort of comp that you, that you cited, um, we've got a more aggressive steroid taper in our study than, than in the Humira study. And so you'd expect to see, uh, a, you know, a higher placebo failure rate as a result. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Please stand by for our next question.
Our next question comes from the line of Louise Chen with Cantor. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question here. I uh, wanted to ask you first on how you plan to address the concentration in the shareholder base. Will that kind of all be done together with some of the announcements that you plan to make before the next earnings call? Um, and then the second thing I wanted to ask you was on expansion of your pipeline. What therapeutic areas are you most interested in? And if you can't say what therapeutic areas you're most interested in, you know, how competitive do you want to get with some of the most topical areas uh, that people are investing in right now? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Louise. Uh, thanks for listening. And those are both uh, those are both uh, really good questions. You know, on the shareholder base side, I think the first answer is uh, that is not a decision that we can make unilaterally. Uh, it depends on our desires, but also the desires of some of our concentrated shareholders who. Uh, in many cases, are uh, happy holders and, frankly, uh, believe what we believe, which is that our stock is uh, meaningfully undervalued given the sort of overall position of the company. So I think, you know, that's a, a discussion we have to have uh, sort of bilaterally with each of them uh, and, uh, you know, we'll take it in turn. You know, I, I think um, what we expect to do is to be uh, ruthlessly economic and thoughtful about how we use our cash for that purpose. Uh, and, you know, I, whether that means we clean them up at once, whether it means we clean some of them up, uh, you know, I think that depends a little bit on uh, on their needs and their appetite and uh, on making the right economic decisions. So, you know, you know stay, stay tuned is the short answer. Um, on the BD question, and, again, I'll, I'll ask Mike if he has comments as well, but, but, you know, I think the short answer is we are sort of necessarily agnostic to therapeutic area because so much of our opportunity comes from strategic shifts and focus at our partners and that leading them to need to, you know, rethink their portfolio. So, you know, if, if someone is doubling down on immunology, maybe something else is falling out as a consequence. So I think we're, we're pretty flexible. Uh, in general, because, uh, because we're in that sort of string of pearls, one program from here, one program from there dynamic, uh, what that tends to mean is we are more excited about areas where a single program can kind of stand on its own. So, so think of the immunology programs that we've developed, for example, uh, and maybe a little bit less excited about areas where you need a concentration, either because it's like oncology where you're developing multiple drugs in combination in order to have a coherent plan, or, you know, maybe because it's something like cell and gene therapy, where you have a sort of a need for manufacturing expertise that provides an economy of scale. So it's not that we would not go into either of those areas, but they're probably like modestly less likely for that reason. Um, Mike, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I think as, as we look, and this is really typical of, of the history of the company, I think as I kind of look at the, you know, the, the, the list of things that I would say that were, you know, excited about and, and, and prosecuting, pursuing right now. It's about as eclectic a list as, as one could kind of, you know, kind of imagine in terms of therapeutic areas. So as Matt said, we're going to continue to be therapeutic area agnostic. I think that, you know, we have tended as for the reasons that Matt stated, we have tended to, to be in areas that probably at first glance tend to be a little bit off the run or a little bit of contrarian. And sometimes, uh, you know, we, I think we've shown that, that um, sometimes those areas tend to heat up, uh, as we have sort of seen with, you know, with FCRN, uh, and then with TL1A in the past. And so that could, that could well happen again. Um, but probably, you know, again, just a mix. I think, I think the other thing I'd say is, yeah. go ahead, Mike. No, no, go, go ahead, Matt. The bar for us is not, is it competitive? The bar for us is can we get something that makes sense for us given the development plan, the economic terms, et cetera. And so, you know, I, there are occasionally programs in very competitive spaces where idiosyncratic factors make them competitive from a sort of like many people care about it perspective that, that are nonetheless easy for us to get. And then there are sometimes programs in less competitive areas where nonetheless they're harder to pry loose. And so I think it's not about sort of how many other people are doing it. It's about what we can get our hands on. Thanks, Louise. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Corrine Jenkins with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. 
Yeah, good morning. Maybe as a follow-on to Louise's question, just how do you think about Royvan's ability to add value to the assets that you're considering in those deals? And what do you view as the company's core competencies in that context? And then I was also wondering, you say that the environment is sort of in really good shape. It's the best it's ever been. But what metrics are you seeing that inform that comment? And as the biotech market kind of has and hopefully will continue to improve, how do you expect the, the environment to um, to go from here? Yeah, thanks, Corinne. Uh, those are both really good questions. You know, on the first, I think it is uh, unquestionably the case that the thing we have done most in our history and best in our history is creative, thoughtful, aggressive clinical development. Uh, we've run 10 positive phase three studies. Uh, we've run many, many phase two studies. We've changed indication plans for programs where we thought that made sense. We've done, we think, quite good job at, at late stage development for programs that, you know, we, we were happy with the choice of indication. So I think, you know, first and foremost, you know, I think value we add when we look at a new program I think the ability to be efficient, thoughtful, and creative on development strategy, selection of indication, and then just strong at execution, the ability to move fast, uh, I think is also something we are uh, really proud of. In terms of the environment, I guess, first of all, yeah, we're watching the, the sort of change in the biotech market unfold. I'd say, like, there are certain kinds of opportunities, like, uh, you know, People used to ask us all the time about the number of biotech companies trading under cash. Some of those dislocations are probably changing a little bit as people feel like they've got better access to capital. Some aren't. There are still plenty of companies out there that, you know, because they don't fit the exact current moment in time are still uh, not sort of obviously in vogue. Uh, and so we're, we're looking broadly, and I think that's all sort of positive. That's a, the main driving factor of uh, of our opportunity set right now isn't the biotech capital markets. It's what's going on in big pharma, uh, and I'd say that is not changing. That is, the level of EPS pressure uh, is significant. Uh, there are patent expirations uh, coming uh, across a number of different pharma companies, frankly, most of the industry, uh, and the IRA is, is forcing uh, our partners to rethink their development plans in various ways, and I think that combination of factors uh, means that R&D portfolio prioritization has to happen at these companies. And, uh, you know, if you are a big pharma company and if you're reprioritizing your portfolio, what we think you want in a partner is the capital to run a good program, the execution to do a good job with it, uh, and a willingness to be creative and thoughtful on structure to provide mutual benefit. And I think there is basically nobody else, at least in sort of biotech, that has the track record at those things that we do. So we think that sets us up as a partner of choice for uh, for a set of partners that have, have real need. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Nina by Trito Guard with Dutch Bank. Your line is open. Hey guys, uh, thanks for taking my question. So just um, a question about the non-infectious uveitis study. Um, can you just remind us what the definition of failure is that you're using in the study? I know in some of the other studies it's a kind of multifactorial definition. And then on CIDP data for betoclumab, just wondering what you would consider to be kind of a meaningful difference uh, from a dose ranging perspective between 340 and 680. Thanks. Yes, yeah, thanks. Uh... Th thanks, Nina. So, um, and welcome back. Um, on NIU, um, Mayuka Frank, uh, feel free to chime in. I think our definition is kind of in line with uh, with the other definitions, and, and I, I don't, sorry, I don't have the exact definition right in front of me, so I, I can sort of make sure it gets out there after the fact. But Mayuka Frank, do you have the exact definition handy? No worries if not. Um, and then uh, on CIDP, you know, again, I think this is a little bit of a of a balance of factors kind of a question. But look, I think uh, what what we've seen so far in CIDP is, you know, like IVIG like response rates, if I had to characterize them. Uh, and I think what what we would hope to see in the higher dose is evidence that we can clear that bar. Something that looks sort of 
better to a patient's and, and, and provider and, and physician's eyes than, than IVIG from an efficacy perspective. I think that's kind of where our general head is at on what we could be able to deliver there. Got it. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, the definition, uh, the primary definition is, is discontinuation or an intercurrent event at week 24. Perfect. Thanks. Um, great. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Yachin Sanuja with Guggenheim. Your line is open. Uh, thank you. Uh, Matt, nice updates here. Uh, question maybe on Vitama. Could you talk about what you're seeing from a competitive dynamic? Uh, your efforts on the marketing front, uh, you continue to invest similar dollar. And, you know, what, like how should we think about inflection with atopic dermatitis? What is the timeline around it and how much of the infrastructure bill you would have to uh, build around AD? Thanks. And also, could you also comment on the net yield? How should we think about calendar 2024 from um, net yield perspective? Thanks. Yeah, perfect. Thank, thank you, Yatin. Uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, they're, they're sort of exactly the right, exactly the right one. You know, from a competitive dynamics perspective, I think we we still uh, look narrowly versus the other novel topical agents in psoriasis. You know, I think we still uh, we still see patients physicians choosing us uh, preferentially. Uh, the truth is, as we've said, we've never been that focused on. Novel topical agents, we've always been focused on capturing share from topical corticosteroids. Uh, you know, we've said historically, if that continues to be work, uh, the, the, the sort of high prescribing docs write the product all the time and are really excited about it. And then there's a long tail who write it four times a month and think that's a lot. And I think haven't sort of come around to our view yet that they can write it 50 times a month. Uh, so, we're, you know, we're, we're working through uh, those dynamics, and I'm optimistic that that, that behavior is changing over time. You know, there's a couple other competitive events. Obviously, one of our competitors recently launched a foam that doesn't directly impact uh, the utilization of our product. We're not being used a lot on the scalp anyway, uh, so uh, you know, I think that should be a good indication for them, but not something we're focused on. We've obviously done some work ourselves on a foam, and uh, we'll continue to think about expansion opportunities in that direction. You know, as far as AD is concerned, you know, it, it's just it's a huge market, uh, and we are excited for our product profile, which we think bluntly is even more differentiated uh, in AD than in psoriasis. AD is also in many ways the less developed and fa potentially faster growing market. And it's also a market that is more primed for novel topicals than psoriasis was because there have been a, a few more on the market ahead of us. And so we can also look to take share, not just from steroids there, but from maybe some, some competitors that have established themselves. You know, I think what we will wind up focused most on for the sort of quarter of that launch that will happen during our next fiscal year. You know, again, we'll get the approval kind of late this calendar year, uh, and then we'll be looking at sort of that, that next fiscal quarter. You know, I think we'll be looking at script volume uptake there and looking to see some, some real growth. Uh, we have said previously we expect to increase the number of reps from about 100 to about 125. You know, I don't think there's like a massive change to our commercial infrastructure, but we're still thinking through uh, in real time, as we learn from the psoriasis side, you know, what to do for DTC, concurrent with that launch, et cetera, that's all sort of ongoing. The prescriber base is also a little bit different. It's a little bit more dispersed, so we're giving some thought to ways to reach docs beyond uh, just the dermatologists. But, uh, you know, stay tuned for potential ideas there. Um, and then, sorry, you might have had uh, – oh, oh, GTN. Uh, yeah, look, I think um, – it's been sort of slow and steady-ish for us. Uh, there's still a little bit of lumpy contracting stuff to get through just as some of the contracts have kind of turned over or changed. But, but in general, I'd say, like, slow and steady accretion over the course of the year. Uh, you know, we may dip a little in the first quarter for – or be flattish in the first quarter for, for sort of normal reasons related to plan resets, et cetera. And then, you know, my guess is the AD launch won't, like, halt our progression, but it may momentarily slow it as we just need to make sure formulary sort of gets set up there quickly. So I think, you know, probably slow and steady is the right way to think about GTN uh, through 2024. Thanks, Jan. Please stand by for our next question. 
Our next question comes from the line of Douglas Sayo with H.C. Wainwright. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking the questions. Just, um, Matt, you indicated that you were sort of still um, sort of agnostic, I guess, in terms of therapeutic area. After you did announce the, the, the telephone transaction with Roche, you sort of said that having, you know, a much greater cash balance potentially positioned you to um, sort of take on um, big opportunities further into development. Does that influence where or sort of certain therapeutic areas that you might favor? Because obviously you have sort of the outlines of such a strong INI portfolio right now. Yeah, thanks, Doug. I appreciate the question and uh, thoughtful as always. You know, you know, I think, first of all, uh, we continue to appreciate the pleasing coherence we have in INI. Uh, we think but, uh, FCRN fits nicely with Repositinib, that Milamab and sarcoid is sort of hewing in the same directions. So, look, I think to the extent that we see things in I and I that work for us, uh, there's something nice to that. You know, I, I think in many ways what, what our capital base and, frankly, our history of development in – remember, some of our first phase three programs were in uh, were in endometriosis and uterine fibroids and, and – uh, and overactive bladder, which are not necessarily indications that we're jumping up and down about literally right now for new programs, but they're, they're big studies and big indications. And I think, you know, we have a lot of history in that kind of disease state. You know, one of the things that I think, frankly, differentiates us from many biotech companies is that our capital base allows us to do larger studies for, for, for broader populations. And so I think we will potentially take advantage of that. Uh, both because those can be big opportunities and because, you know, there, there are opportunities that will sort of necessarily get passed over by smaller folks who don't have the, the capital position of the development experience to take them on. So I think that is a, a competitive opportunity for us that, uh, that, we will be, uh, that we will be taking advantage of. And, Matt, I guess as a follow-up to the extent that you perhaps do pursue – opportunities outside of I and I, would you think about sort of new areas as ones in which you would want to start to build some scale, meaning if you executed a, a new a, a, one single transaction at potential therapeutic area, would you be like, likely looking to add to that? Thank you. Yeah, you know, it, it's a discussion that we have internally uh, as we look at our pipeline. And again, there are things that we see where you know, we see a program and it makes more sense as a part of our portfolio than it does sort of on a standalone basis. So I think it's, it's certainly possible as we build out additional programs that they will become nexuses of scale. I, I think it's important to know, though, we evaluate every program on its own merits. We evaluate every program based on the data we've got. And I think we're going to pursue sort of value and risk over uh, – over sort of therapeutic concentration per se. But, uh, Mike, uh, maybe I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I think, look, I, I think as you've, uh, seen from us typically when we, when we bring in a new program, I mean, it's sort of like by definition, it's got to have enough half to, um, to kind of stand on its own. I, I think that's the lens through which we look, look at it. That's the lens through which we sort of hire a team to sort of prosecute around it, you know, uh, we, we typically call it a new vent, but, but that's kind of how we think about it. And, you know, last night, it's, I guess, like I would say, I can't underscore the comment Matt made uh, enough about capital being a major competitive advantage for us, you know, um, both in terms of, uh, both in terms of, I think, like what that brings as a solution to, uh, you know, a, a prospective pharma partner and that we have uh, the sort of scale of capital that, is meaningful to them and, and that is unique to us. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I think we, 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 uh, we view that as precious. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Great. Thanks Doug, for the question. Appreciate it. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Robin Kanaka with Truist Securities. Your line is open. Hey, this is Nishant. I'm on for Robin. Thank you for taking our question. So, 
Um, maybe on Vitama GTN, um, you mentioned, you know, you see a steady, slow and steady over a period of next year. Uh, you mentioned that last call, you see overall, you reach a, to reach 50% at steady state. Do you still believe that that to be the number for GTN long term, uh, to reach 50% steady state? And in terms of big picture for the company, uh, how many assets would you retain um, over long term? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, appreciate the questions, and thanks thanks for listening. Um, you know, I, I, on the GTN question, look, I think uh, I have no real change to, like, the long-term steady-state guidance. I think it's going to take, take uh, time and scale, uh, especially because, remember, a, a meaningful portion of the remaining yield accretion comes from volume, uh, which is, is, is really just going to take some time to build up to. So, But, but I think our guidance of 50% is sort of the same as – it, let's say every other biotech launch program, uh, and I think the, the the trends that buffet us will be largely the same as the trends that buffet other programs. So, so no, no change to to sort of long-term steady-state guidance per se. Um, and then, you know, uh, assets that we retain for the long term. You know, I think the, the short answer is we bring in programs that we are excited to invest in that we believe will be important commercially, that we believe we will generate important clinical data on. And basically everything we bring in, our plan is to retain it and develop it. And I think the thing that throws us off that trajectory is just the information we learn along the way, both in terms of the quality of the data that we generate and in terms of what other people think of the program and what their plans might be. But I think, you know, if if you gave me a crystal ball and it showed that we kept all of the programs in our pipeline and they were sort of commercial opportunities for us down the line. I'd be pretty excited about that. I just, uh, you know, I think we, we, we will continue to be ruthlessly economic along the way. And some of the targets we're working in are really attractive targets, not just to us, but to prospective partners. So I think that could, that's the kind of thing that takes us off that path. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I would like to turn the call back over to Matt for closing remarks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, operator, for moderating. Thanks to all our analysts and obviously to the to all of our investors and to the entire team at Royvent. Uh, we appreciate it. Another uh, another quarter with a lot for us to be proud of and a lot to look forward to in building year for 2024. So uh, yeah, looking forward to getting back on the phone. I'm sure we'll do it uh, multiple times to come, and uh, I will speak to you all soon. Ladies Have and gentlemen, day. this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.